Welcome to Beyond the Veil, where we're learning to live beyond the veil, the veils that separate us from the truth. Now, before I begin, I'm going to share a few song uh, lines from a song that Kim Clement wrote. And the lines are this, I take a step beyond the pain. I take a step beyond the veil. I take a step into the place you have for me. Okay. So, this is what this is about. And in the next few weeks, I'm going to be bringing some people in that maybe will help share their experiences of stepping beyond the veil. But before we do this, I'm going to talk about what um, scientists call brain trees. These are actual structures in your brain that look like trees. And a tree, as we can see over here, has a trunk, but then it starts to branch off. And that's, and that's what these structures are in our brains, that they actually branch off. They start with a, a something, and then they branch off. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Okay. Then I'm going to, if time permits, uh, talk about the vision that I talked a little bit or said I had in the last video and share how this relates to this. And... Uh, in a spiritual sense. So let's start here. We have three heads up here, and they're supposed to all be the same person, even though they might not look like it because my drawing's not all that great. But what happens is, with the first one, he this person looks out, and he sees rain coming down. Maybe this first time he's ever experienced rain. Let's just assume that. So he walks out into the into the uh, into nature out into the open and he gets wet and he and what the mind always wants to do at that point the mind wants to draw a conclusion about this experience so he says oh i get wet rain i get wet so the conclusion becomes if it's raining outside and you don't take an umbrella or whatever, you're going to get wet. So that's a, that's a valid conclusion because we know physically if we go out in the rain, we're going to get wet. So that becomes the conclusion that starts the tree over here. So this is, this is how this tree begins, from an experience and a conclusion that the mind draws. Now go down here. And say this is, you know, a few years later, or maybe next or next week. Time doesn't matter. This is for illustration purposes. But let's say the same person really wants to go to the ballpark, and maybe he's got a child playing in at the ballpark that he really needs to see and support, and it's just everything to him to go to that ballpark to be with that child or experience that event and he looks out and he sees it's raining well he knows from his past experience that what's going to happen is everyone that goes outside is going to get wet and so that all of a sudden now alarms him because you know i really wanted to do this and now it's raining and it means the game's going to get rained out. I'm not going to get to do my, my grandchild, my child will be disappointed, what, whatever. So now his mind has to interpret, a con come up with a conclusion about the rain. Well, what maybe does he think? He thinks, well, I'm not in charge of the rain. Oh, you know, who makes it rain? And so... He might hear, and we'll go back to our Donald Duck again, the good Donald and the bad Donald. He might hear from the bad Donald, well, God's in charge of the rain. And he thinks about that. You know, of all the days that it could have been sunny and not rain, this would have been very important to me. And God's letting it rain. So he draws a conclusion about God. Now, it may be a very subtle God, 
a very subtle conclusion. It could be something along the lines like, man, this is really disappointing. Why couldn't God do this? And I've heard people say this hundreds of times when they look at the weather and, and some event that they get that they had an interest in going to all of a sudden is not is rained out. So I've heard, why couldn't God have given us a nice day? You know, something like that. Well, that that conclusion now, based upon this conclusion, now becomes a branch on the tree. And so this branch on the tree loops back around to the, the brain. And maybe another, he, and then this person has another experience. And maybe that experience is that they pray for somebody to be healed, and the person isn't healed. In fact, the person dies. And somehow this, this experience now gets linked in this tree to previous experiences, and the person says, well, what should I have expected? God let it rain on this day. And I mean, you may do this without rationally getting it out there. It's all, it could be feelings. It could be just something that you can't quite put words to. But then all of a sudden now that experience of God can't be trusted is reinforced now in a big, powerful way because someone that you wanted to live, you prayed to God, and that person died. And so this tree expands out. And now, if we would continue, every disappointment eventually comes back to what? God. And all of a sudden, you've built this structure inside your mind, inside your physical brain, that you use now to reinterpret the rest of your experiences to the point that God becomes not someone who's loving and kind and has provided you life up to this point, provided you sustenance, all of these things. God now becomes a bastard. And there's no way you can love him. And you become separated from him. You separate from him. Because who wants to be around a bastard? Who wants to be around someone who's evil? Now, who puts these subtle thoughts in your, in your head? Who puts these, these things that help us interpret our experiences to draw to conclusion that builds these trees? Who does that? Is it God that does that? Well, if he is the one putting them in there that drives him away from us, <laughs> then that doesn't make too much sense. But if there's an enemy, like we talked about in the last video, that wants to drive you away from God through your brain, through experiences that you have to decide whether they're good or evil, that makes more sense. That's probably who's doing this. This is why it's important that the scripture says take every thought, literally every emotion, thought, every experience captive. What does that mean? It means to judge the experiences in the light of the truth. Because if you judge the experiences in the light of truth, and you shine light on what you're thinking, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, you won't get into this loop of negative experiences, and those negative trees inside your brain won't have control over you. This is what we need to understand and break free from. And there's a lot of good resources out about that, but for the purposes of this video, let's go on to the vision. Here's the vision I had. And, and when I say vision, I'm not saying, you know, it was this major kind of thing that, you know, I was all of a sudden taken up in the clouds or anything. In fact, uh, I believe I had it. I don't even remember, but I know I had it. But uh, so I, I, I might have been uh, asleep or in that twilight 
zone between waking and uh, falling, being asleep and waking. But here's the vision. I was in the air, soaring. I was flying. I was actually flying. And I'm like, this is cool. <laughs> this is something I've, I, I've never done before. This is something I'm incapable of doing. So I'm really excited because I'm flying. And if you know me, I don't like heights, but in this being on ladders even. I, so the idea of me flying was really far-fetched that I should like that, but I'm flying and I'm free. And I know that the Lord God is with me. I know he's with me and I'm flying along. And all of a sudden, I'm looking down at the what I thought was the earth and I see something very interesting. I see a desert, and on either side of the desert, I see lush, green, beautiful um, forests with lakes and things, but in the middle of it's this desert. And so I'm looking down at the desert, and I see these, this incredible thing. I see um, structures being built there, and they're huge structures. In fact, they're, those structures are obstructing the wind that would come in from the fertile, beautiful place and create more greenery, more lushness, more, more of uh, what is beautiful. And so I see these structures being built in there. And I actually see these little things running around building these structures. And I'm like, Lord, what is this about? And he says, why don't you go down and see it? So I go down a little bit more, and I see that these beasts that are building these structures are really ugly. They're, they're demonic. They're, they're just nasty. And I asked the Lord, what is this? And he says, that's your soul. And I'm like shocked. I'm like, what do you mean? That's your soul. That's your mind. That's, uh, that's, the part of you that from which your will springs and your decisions spring. And I'm like, well, I don't want these things here. And he goes, well, you built them. And I prayed to him. I said, please remove them. Take them away. I can't handle this. I can't have these things in me. And the Lord said, I'll take them away with this and he handed me a sword and I picked the sword up he gave it to me I had the sword and I had a real distinct uh, impression that this sword only fit my hand that if I were to take this sword and give it to someone else my wife uh, my daughters uh, you or, or anybody that wouldn't fit your hand. And I said, what am I to do with this? And he said, go down and start removing these structures. And so I did as he said, and I went down onto the earth. I flew down there with this sword. And as soon as these things saw this sword, I saw panic in their faces. And when I took that sword, I started slashing away at these entities and the structures that they had built, that I had allowed them to build in me through not taking thoughts captive. And so I'm, I'm doing this, and there's a lot of structures. This is going to take me a while to do. This isn't uh, uh, an instantaneous thing like people are led to believe that you say the sinner's prayer, you come to Jesus, and it's a done deal. It's all over. No, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of a process. So when he gives me the sword, it isn't like they all disappear. I have to participate with the sword he gave me in undoing these structures. And why I, I want to conclude with is this is the interesting thing. People cite the, the chapters, I believe they're in Ephesians, about the armor of God. 
But the one thing they miss about the armor, it's a very important thing. Armor only does its job if it fits the person that it's meant to protect. Just like the sword that I was given may be too heavy for you to lift. Um, maybe the sword that someone else is given is too heavy for me to lift. It's got to be the sword fit to my hand. Same way with the helmet. What good is a helmet if it's huge and doesn't fit your head? In fact, it's going to be detrimental to your defense if you have such a helmet. Imagine a shield that was too heavy for you to pick up or a shield that was too thin to, to stop what you're going to face. You know, it could be a shield that stops something, but... If, if it's not fitted to what you're going to face, if it's not personal to you, it's not going to stop what you're going to face. And you could go through every piece of armor mentioned in, in the, that scripture. But if you miss the fact that it has to be fitted to you, your armor, not someone else's armor, you miss the whole understanding of the passage. And see, that's what a lot of the church does. What I call churchianity, that's what it does. Is it takes armor and it multiplies it. It, it produces books. It produces a, a way to grow the church, a way this, a way that. And what it does is it becomes impersonal. It becomes impersonal a process that I believe a lot of times is captured by these trees that leads not really to freedom for a lot of people, maybe a few, but it leads to deeper bondage for people, more structures. Because see, they try the newest fad, they try the newest thing, believing that this is what God wants them to do, and then it doesn't work out, and they become disappointed, and we get back into this loop again. Well, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that's based upon the power of the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit living in you, then your armor will be fitted to you. If you're trying to put on the armor of someone else, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. So if your relationship with Jesus is based upon a structure or a form not fitted to you, it's going to be bad news. You're going to end up being disappointed. You know, most of the growth in the church today, what we call the growth in the institutional church, by and large, it's not growing. In fact, it's shrinking. The institutional church is shr shrinking. But most of the growth that some churches experience is what? Someone who went to one form and became dissatisfied. So they go to a new church, a new place. And now they're counted as new members, like the church is growing. When in reality, they left this place because it, you know, it, it was, was not working. It wasn't armor fitted to them. And so they go to this next church and they say, oh, maybe this armor will fit better. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will satisfy my soul. Maybe this will stop this, these terrible thoughts I have. Maybe this form will do that. And too many times they find, no, this doesn't work either. And if this continues to go, what happens? They start to doubt whether God exists. They start to doubt whether he's real. They start to doubt. And that's what the enemy wants. Trust Doubt is, in some ways, the opposite of trust. 
faith which pleases God. They lose their faith. They separate from God. Now, I'm not saying they're not going to be in heaven or have eternal life. I'm not saying that. But just think what the enemy does through that. He takes a warrior, someone who could take the sword that God gives him and put his enemy, God's enemy, Satan, under Jesus' foot. And he takes that warrior and he disarms him and takes him out of the battle. That's what he's trying to do. He knows he can't sever the, the bond that God has with his children through the blood of Christ. He can't do that. But what he can do is get them to become a son who goes away from the father into another place looking for what he thought he couldn't get from the father. That's what this is about. It's having those prodigal sons return to the father because now they're fitted in the armor that God intended for them so that they can walk beyond the veil. Talk to you soon.